Phil, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. This is a great opportunity for me as well. Yeah. So we usually start off by, um, since a class is uh, significantly composed of students, um, it's helpful for people to get a sense of your background before you got into all this. So presumably in high school you weren't thinking, I'm going to be an IP guy. Um, what did you do in college? What did you do right after college? So how did you find your way to this path? So funny enough, I, I think sometimes the path finds you. Um, so I was always a curious guy in college. Um, I actually, in high school, had three different internships. So mind you, when I went to college, the internet was known about, but no one had email addresses. My first jobs, no one had a PC at their desk. You would have a shared workstation that you'd go if you needed to use something like that. Um, I worked uh, in an R&D facility for a lock company. I worked in a medical device company for a summer. Uh, trying to figure out what windings you would use on a catheter balloon that wouldn't come off in the middle of a medical procedure. And I worked at a software control automation company. So I, I think when I say the path kind of finds you is that it's, it's up to you to go out and try a bunch of different things. And then from that, you'll learn about what you're interested in. And carrying that into college, the irony of all of this is I worked as a, as a, as a welder in a, in a metals lab. <laughs> so we'd fix heavy machinery and equipment at late night. Um, and to be honest, I had, I had learned about intellectual property from my brother and I filed for a patent back in the day before you could do your own searches. And I remember it took all the money that we had to do a patent search. I think it was like $3,000. And I got back a stack of papers. And the really disappointing thing about that is that none of it related to anything that we were trying to achieve in the patent we wanted to file. And I couldn't afford to do another search. So put that aside, and I, I walk out of class one day. I'm a, I'm a senior, and I'm going through job interviews. And I kid you not, a newspaper blows across my leg. <laughs> I pick it up. It says law firms on campus today and tomorrow interviewing for what they call patent engineers. And uh, they're going to open an office right near where I was going to school. And I went and I interviewed. And I got the job. Huh. So I, I stumbled into patent law. Um, but I think for me, it was something that represented an opportunity to um, really stay on the creative side, not be locked into something. Um, so. That's how it all started. And, and so, at, so from law, did you, I mean, Finjen was around before you got there. So what were you doing before Finjen? Just briefly. So I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I've stayed on the business side uh, the entire part of my career. Um, when I went to work at the law firm, I was really tasked with understanding the fundamentals of the law. You know, how do you file a patent? Why is a patent important to a business? What happens when you get the plaque? Do you hang it on the wall, or is there some actual useful business application that you can use that for, some sort of leverage? Um, I learned very quickly that I didn't get along working with law firms. I didn't, the, the hourly billing thing didn't work with me, and I didn't work with it very well. So, uh, so I left that after about two years. But I didn't realize the experience that I had there and how valuable it was until I went in-house at a medical device company. So I worked for the board of directors. And the board had decided they were going to refund this medical device startup. And they wanted to bifurcate that funding, 90% for you to continue developing the technology on the research side, 10% set aside to make sure that you protect everything with patents. And if you think about that, what it was was a hedge on the investment. So you often throw out this, this phrase, research and development. Those are two very different things in the medical device world. And when you're seeking funding, make sure you're very clear in which stage you're in. So we were a research project. The company had already been funded 80 plus million dollars for research. And we were two orders of magnitude beyond NASA in terms of sensitivity for the equipment we were building. So we were very much a research project. It wasn't like, let's just now reduce it into a development effort. That's totally different. And so what the board wisely did was said, well, Someday this research project, whether it's here or elsewhere, is going to turn into something. Let's make sure that while we're funding that research initiative that we get the protection on the ideas, the concepts, where this industry might develop. And was the... So, so first of all, that's interesting that it was a specific ratio. One of the questions we had in a prior class from, was, um, when you're a fledgling company, how do you think about how much you should set aside for IP? Because the, 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 the value you'll extract from the IP comes so far down the road and the value you extract from R&D is much more near term. Was the 90-10 literally the ratio that was set aside? 
Um, or was that? Uh, I have to tell you, I hate this question. So, because uh, <laughs> awesome. there's a practical <laughs> answer to that, right? You know, here's the reality. Look, you know, if if you're going and you're going to develop a business and you're going to compete against a company that's already generating 100 million dollars, anybody's going to tell you your goal is to get to market with a competitive product. Right? And, and sometimes in, in a startup, you've got to make a real decision, right? Patent application filing isn't, isn't not inexpensive. We, we would have to make the decision all the time. Do we hire an engineer who can work on this program for the next year? Or do I spend a month stopping effectively what I'm doing and giving that money, which I would pay for engineering support, to a law firm because maybe I don't understand the process. But, but making that capital investment, like that's a serious thing. But then there's this gray area, right, where you can't expect that just getting to market first is going to carry the day in terms of your ability to operate in the business, right? There is a point at which you have to recognize you do need to make that commitment. And if you make it too late, then you're really in trouble, right? So look at some of the big companies in the Silicon Valley that had to go to much larger, you know, weight and stone institutions to say, Hi, I'm here, I got this big product, I got all this liability, you know, hey, would you mind filtering a thousand patents over to me to cover what I'm doing? It's very common today. So, you know, I'm a big believer in IP. I think you need to understand how to, to know how to use the process in filing for provisional protections and being realistic about where your market is going to exist, right? You know, don't file everywhere in Europe. It's very expensive. You know, maybe ports of entry is generally an 80-20 rule. But yeah, I'm, I'm a believer that, you know, you should at least be educated on how intellectual property could impact the growth of your business and that you should, at some reasonable point in the business's growth, actually make that investment. It's very important. And so in that case, before we get to Fingen, um, the medical device company, did it end up, did patents end up being core to the strategy at the end of the day, if there is an end of the day yet? So <clears throat> the company's research project was non-invasive glucose monitoring. So what that means is basically from the infrared radiation emitted from your skin, I put your skin on a very expensive diamond plate window with gold, you know, uh, anti-reflective coatings on it. And I've got a 12 detector matched array and a perfectly linear collimator to mix the signal as it comes down. And I'm trying to detect and correlate an analyte in your blood. Okay, that's really complicated. It's the holy grail. And that was 20 years ago, so people were still trying to do it then. It doesn't exist today. Um, so if we had been so narrow to focus on just non-invasive glucose monitoring, the patents would have since been very expensive to prosecute, would have since issued, and now would have since expired. <laughs> so, so what we were thinking about is, what is it that you can do to correlate better to glucose in blood? And we thought about it more broadly. And we thought about, what if you took blood out of the body and put it in a test strip? What could you do to use less blood out of the body in a test strip? What, what are we learning about physiology, right? There's all kinds of things that, you know, are become very important, right? Skin pigmentation, whether you're a smoker, whether you drink a lot of water, you know, nationality actually has a lot of influence in whether or not you can get the same type of radiation off the skin. So we were much more, more broadly focused over here on what non-invasive and what glucose monitoring in general was. And, and yeah, so to this day, I believe that patent portfolio is why that company continues to get funded, right? Because non-invasive glucose monitoring, for anybody that knows a diabetic person, that does not exist today as a commercial product. Hmm. Got it. So, so far, it's been primarily a fundraising. The, the IP has been around for fundraising and for sort of uh, market protection. It hasn't been offensively used yet. My, my understanding is that there's about $150 million in this one company. And that if you really think about that, despite some of the revenues the company has, the value is almost entirely locked up in that patent portfolio. Got it. OK, great. Let's move on to Finjin, because I want to I wanna set the stage for the later conversation. So um, the Finjin story before you got there, Finjin started sort of how? And was, was around for how many years before you got there? So FinGen this year is 20 years old. And for those of you that remember the antivirus days in 1995, 1996, um, FinGen's whole premise was to build a disruptive technology because it believed that the signature-based approach to protecting PCs and, and other content was with signatures. Now, all you have to do is flip a byte or a bit or maybe remove a piece of networking equipment, and those things can come right through and infect a computer. And if you remember ever having to install operating system software, it would say, please disable antivirus, you know, or you'll never finish this install. And the reason is because 
A signature is, I know everything about this virus. I write down what it looks like, smells like, it's this big, it starts like this and ends like this, and you put that in a database, and your computer is constantly using resources to check the database. And Finjan just said, look, that's ridiculous. There's got to be a better way. So a gentleman named Shlomo Tabul had this idea after entering a competition with Sun Microsystems. They said, we've got this thing called Java, and it's going to change the internet. It's going to become the, the communication language for the internet. And so they held a million dollar competition and said anybody could write a killer app to demonstrate Java's power, you know, you win the prize. So Shlomo entered that and then actually quickly realized later that he more enjoyed trying to swim upstream into the network. And uh, he could by circumventing what the security of the day was. And he realized there's a problem here. So he really went out and actually hired a bunch of high school and college students to help him with this. And the whole notion of what Finjohn was is there needs to be a better way. There needs to be a more proactive solution. And this is right around the time that malware was coming around. And, and for those that don't know the difference between virus and malware, malware is polymorphic, metamorphic. It changes itself, looks different on an Apple versus a PC, may or may not do something today, but may do something tomorrow. And he just said, we need to be able to look at the content and the files and, and identify the behaviors as they come through the network. That's what Finjohn did. So it was disruptive, truly disruptive to the industry. Okay. And were there, it, it was, was, uh, were fi was filing IP part of the strategy in the early days or did that come later on? Day one. Day one. And I would say that today, the opportunity for shareholders to find a return on that invested capital uh, in large part is locked up entirely again in the intellectual <laughs> property. Hmm. Had they waited a year or even two years, the opportunity, which I'm sure we'll talk about, would have been vastly different today. Okay, that's interesting. And, and so Finjan was a cybersecurity operating company with a patent portfolio. And it, it was sold in 2009, is that right, to M86. That's right. Um, and so at that point, something interesting happened. They, the company, and, and this is a question because I'm not, I'm not as familiar with it obviously as you are. So the company was sold, but the, all or part of the patent portfolio was carved off. Is that right? So. <clears throat> It's funny, cybersecurity as a phrase didn't exist back then. You know, we used to call it data security and, and endpoint software security. So, you know, it's always this convergence of multiple technologies that, that lead to that. Yeah, but your, your point is sound, right? So they were developing products, selling those in the market. They were getting really great patents. And, and in 2005, there was really this inflection point where you've got a very traditional board of directors with venture capital ties or private equity ties, even some corporate ownership. Cisco and Microsoft are owners in the company. But there was this, you know, you got 150 people who are building and selling products and traveling the world, and it's a very low margin business because it's an upstart, you know, it's complicated. And you put a couple of guys on an airplane a few times, and they come back with a big license from Microsoft. And so the board kind of looked and said, well, this is really interesting. The margins on getting a license for the patents was, was you know, really high. You know, we, you know, we come back with a $10 million check when that's maybe your entire year's worth of revenue. So from 2005 until 2009, the board had decided that Maybe there's an opportunity to let Finjan's technology out into the wild through licensing because clearly we are not able to make sure that this technology gets deployed as broadly as it needs to. And that was the idea of the licensing program. So there was licensing that began in 2005. And then there were some market challenges in, in the 2008-2009 timeframe, not unique to Finjan, but to the industry in general. And that's more of a technology discussion. But the, the idea came, look, Maybe there needs to be a consolidation in the industry. So Finjan went out in the industry and a company called M86, who had recently merged with another company, um, we merged our technology business in. M86 continued to sell the Finjan products. Trustwave then bought M86, continued to sell the Finjan products. Sing Singapore Telecom just last year, this is demonstrating the relevance of Finjan's technologies. Singtel bought Trustwave, still sells the Finjan products. What Finjan kept in that deal was all of its intellectual property. So here you now have a company that was making products, that owns all of its IP, has a very active licensing and enforcement program, and now holds a bunch of equity in all these other companies for offloading its product business into a combined entity that continues to sell the products. Very unique, uh, in my mind. Yeah, that's interesting. And was, was the idea that this would be, um, and at what point, it went, it was, so it went public, you're now a public company, at what point did it go public? Four years after we divested our operating business, we became a public company. So it sells to M86 in 2009. <clears throat> it, it, you guys operated as an IP pure play from 2009 to 2013. That's right. And then made the decision to go public, which a number of IP pure plays have. 
Um, it's been a for the whole cl for the whole industry. It's been a bit of a rough road up from a from a, a stock price perspective. Um, I'm I'm interested in a, a few sentences on the, the the logic that drove you towards the idea or drove the company. Were you there at that point? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you got there by then. Um, the logic that drove you towards deciding that the public markets were a better place to do business than the private markets, and also um, looking back on how that's played out. Um, would you do that again if you were to do it again today? So a lot of this goes back to once you make a, a commitment to your financing partners, you're beholden to them, public or private, right? You know, I, I, everyone has a boss, I have a boss. Um, at that point, you had companies that had been in Fingen and, and had put real money in, 13, 15, 17 years in. And so there's frustration in that. I mean, we spent $65 million to develop the technology. We sold between 72 and $75 million in products. And today we sit at having generated $225 million in licensing fees. So there's frustration. And the frustration is, well, we're now what most people didn't know is we were excluded from competing in the market on a technology side under the M86 deal for some extended period of time. And when Trustway bought them, that moved even further. That didn't expire until March of 15. So it lasted a long time. But now these venture capital guys have to you know, sort of balance their frustration with wanting to get out and the reality that they're still venture capitalists. They want young minds like yourselves to walk into their offices and say, hey, I need money for this new great thing I want to do and I want to bring to market. So what the public market represented was some obvious factors, which is liquidity for some of us who've been in a long time and access to capital. Let's say you want to continue to be in business, then access to capital is great because you won't knock on my door anymore and go to the public markets. But there's something else, and, and I think more important to that too, is you know, we do licensing and enforcement, and that makes the news for a lot of reasons, right? And, and I would make an argument that it's not a broken patent system, that there's some behavioral issues that need to be resolved. But they really wanted to make sure that there was a way to continue licensing and enforcing, to find a way to take some of the profits that we're getting from that program and there was a mandate to recommit that back into the industry. And one of the things about being a public company is, and we joke now most of the time, I make the joke that we're in the transparency business. So there's this whole idea that being a public company requires me to stay focused on the merits, requires me to understand the importance of being credible in licensing negotiations and reasonable in my offers and always being focused on getting paid. Right? So that was, that was a big thing. And then they wanted us to make sure that from the profits that we got that we were recommitting back into cybersecurity. So we've made an investment in a venture fund. Today we operate a cybersecurity advisory services business. And we have a mobile security product. And I encourage all of you to download the app out of your Google or Apple <laughs> store. So, Because um, it's a great product, right? It's about bringing transparency to consumers. You have no idea. When you go to your phone and you type in CNN.com, you wouldn't know that there's 32 trackers that are taking your data. And here's the funny part. Would you be upset if I told you that if you turned all 32 of those off, your browsing experience at CNN doesn't change at all? That's something I want to know, right? It's my data, and I think we're moving towards that, but that's my soapbox. Got it. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Phil.